Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We've got another turn for you here. It is midsummer in year five of the Ascension War in, in this year's tournament finals. And oh boy, do we have another fun turn for you. I mean, just look at all of this carnage. And one of the interesting uh, things that we're seeing here, just from the very start in the magic phase section, you're seeing many of these horror attacks against uh, Shababa. We'd already seen a lot of horrors leading into this war, with Gath being the likely perpetrator. Uh, but this is the first time that we're seeing Vettiheim fire back to this degree. Yeah. So if you missed last turn, consider going and checking it out. There weren't necessarily extremely huge battles, but it, I feel like there was a ton of stuff cooking for this turn. Particularly this turn, it looks like we... I'm expecting a big battle with Tianqi and Pan, and we potentially may also have a really big battle in a fight that was dodged the previous turn between Vettiheim and Gath. So potentially going to be a really exciting one this turn too but we talked a lot about the setup maybe what to expect the last episode yeah. um so let's just get into it yeah start with a message from tnc i'm glad we have a practice of defending our under construction forts but wow the erythia nat break invasion was a huge surprise as best we can tell he feels we broke our agreement to give him 129 which was one of the pre three provinces we told him he could take for neutrality in the coalition war. From our perspective, to cut off Pan from taking, from attacking us north of the lake. So let's go ahead and go to 129 here. So that's this one. So Tianqi gave this to Arithia so that Pan couldn't attack him through here, and instead Pan and Tianqi could fight only through this. And that makes sense, given TNG's propensity towards actually deploying Doomstacks with all the gems and so on, that having right. a smaller front benefits him compared to Pan, which has an easier time deploying very threatening mid-sized armies. Yeah. Um, so, but then, so he had given this to Arithia, but then Arithia failed to actually move in to our great annoyance, right? And that left that war front open for Pangea to attack. He brought 129 up after we had already put gold in to start a fort there. But after some discussion, he agreed to return to a nap three with us and attack Zabalba without responding to our thinking that we feel that we completed our obligatory, our, our, our obligations or our query for whether there was something else we could do to make him happy. See, to me, that actually makes a fairly large difference is that if it's something where, you know, you end on bad terms, you have an argument... And it like basically comes across that there is ill will there in the discussion, and then that's like where it ends. Then I can sort of see that as being an okay, we don't have a nap declaration of war thing, even if you don't spell it out, right? That like there's clearly something cooking that they're not happy with you, you're on bad terms. Whereas if you continue talking and then agree to a nap, like if you agree to a nap after the fact that where this thing is brought up, that to me is is a flat out nap break because Whatever, you know, you would have considered to be a nap violation in, ahead of that, you know, with the thing that he, you didn't get the problem, right. you promised or whatever. If you make a nap after that discussion, that to me actually makes a very big difference because it then makes the other player feel as though it's a closed case. Yeah. And, you know, we'd have to, I, I, they pro there was a bunch of kind of arguing in the game channel and I think they shared screenshots of DMs and I'm not exactly sure what was actually posted there. So uh, just bear in mind that this is maybe there was some murkiness uh, on, on what was said, but, but I agree with what you said as well. Detailed timeline is in the discord and game chat. My best theory is that John Ahito misinterpreted a promise Latch made that if we lost the expected battle with pan over 129 on turn one of the coalition war, then we would try to raid it back. So Arithia could take it as being not limited to the scenario where we lost. We won that battle, and we evacuated the province as per our deal, but Arithia didn't attack it. Without explanation, I think he was busy in real life. And eventually, Pan took the free province. Several turns later, we got it back from Pan in the peace negotiations, and it appears that Arithia felt that we still needed to give it to him. I can see him being grumpy because he wanted that province, but that's just not... not but that is not a just cause for premeditated treachery, signing an app and then surprise attacking two turns later. Yeah, I agree with that. 
In other news, we, oh God, I don't know if we can read all these Tanchi messages. In other news, we found the, the glowing hill at the throne of fortune in 64 this turn. So that gives you access to elf sacreds. Yeah, they're the M.A. Eru elf sacreds, I believe. So they're not that yeah. impressive, but they are, you know, sacreds with decent stats and glamour. Right. And, uh, you know, they, I think for Tanchi's Blessed, they get reinvigoration, a bunch of resistances. So they'll be pretty useful. And, uh, don't and defense. defense. Yeah. With the throne of water bonus too. Right. Um, with gate Gale Gate stolen, our elite uh, our elite troop production is now ten cubes, eight point five ancestor vessels, nine Dahuinian seeds, or however you say that. I don't know about uh, Dawin. I know that she, she is pronounced she. She, yeah. Three jade maidens, five celestial soldiers, and ten wyverns a turn. And a partridge, no pear tree. What do wyverns take? Is it, are they Those nature? They're air. Yeah. Wait, but couldn't you turn air into soldiers? They no. use different casters. The Celestial Soldiers oh. is air astral. Wyverns is, yeah, uh, just air. So Wyverns okay. are also drakes. So if you have Dragon Master and the uh, Dragon Stick, you get more Wyverns from that as well. So it's possible that he has a couple casters set up for that, where he's getting like a plus three bonus. So he's doing two Wyvern casts per turn with uh, bonus okay. casters. Okay. Because he has the Nature Mages that are Nature Air. And the Dragon Master spell is nature, which is kind of awkward sometimes. So that's probably where the wyverns are coming from. Yeah. If we're not fighting, which burns a ton of air gems, if we are, we skip the Celestial Soldiers. We only just started making Jade Maidens after our recent fort construction spree. They're pretty mediocre late game troops with low MR, low damage, no dark vision, but they're sacred, so they'll have all our resists. And thus be useful nonetheless. Yeah, so the other unit, which he didn't mention there, but which kind of fits that same niche of just having all the resistances, is a Mechanical Men. So they're just a generic Earth Summon. And actually, Earth Gems are important, so maybe you can't afford them. But they're a mindless unit, so they're not going to be bothered with morale stuff. And, of course, they just have Omni Resist, so you can cast or you can deploy them into Wrathful Skies and Firestorm and so on and not ever need to yeah. worry about them. So they're another great, I wouldn't say elite unit because they don't kill things very well, but they fill the same role that the Jade Maidens that he's recruiting does, namely mm -hmm. that they have Omni Resist. And just by having that, they can fight fine in all when all the late game spells are going around. Yeah. Yeah, I, know, I mean, we know TNT is especially short on Earth Gym, so it's unlikely he's going to do that particularly, but that's a great point. It's another thing that Pan um, can do. <laughs> yeah. But Pan, they're saving them gems for something else. It's not troop summoning. I've been feeling very much like we couldn't afford to take major losses for a while, but I think this is now enough to make a quite serviceable army corps every four turns. Extremely good force production for a non-blood nation. Meanwhile, our battle mages are all recruit anywhere. Our ability to field armies is thus limited by the valuable 25% nature to earth ones and death to air twos. Mainly, oh, getting one of of them requires about 800 gold of mage recruitment and gear. With our tiny earth, com, uh, earth income and limited hammers, we've only been able to build up enough gear to field about 1.5 high quality gem burn remote wipe resistant armies at a time. Yeah. So that's TNG's thing. They've been like shuttling this gear back and forth across war fronts. And that's kind of what you need to do when you're doing this gem heavy doom stack style, which TNG is favoring. Right. Um, but it also means while they're able to suffer attrition of troops and mages, if they have, so like if they lose a quarter of their troops and like 20% of their mages in a big battle, that's not really a problem. They can replenish those losses pretty easily because if they win the battle, they're going to pick up any items or most of the items that are dropped. Right. But if their main army ever gets wiped where they lose the items, then it's like, okay, they can't like, it'll take up 12 turns to make the items back. You know, it's like a, it's a loss they can't recover from. Right. That's the, the 0.5 army that he's talking about. Right. I don't think it would take 12 turns, but I think that it would definitely slow him down such that for the next couple turns, he couldn't take another fight and replacing it would essentially empty his gem treasury. So that would basically yeah. be his war chest gone. Um, so right. I would say that he could take one major army loss, but he would have a very hard time recovering from two. Yeah. So while I feel the need, so while I feel the army we have attacking Panji is quite capable, if through some misfortune we were to lose it, dot, 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 replacing the gear would be nearly impossible. Let's hope Pan can't kill it. God, you need some wood to knock on after saying that. I, I, I don't... Tempting the fates, yeah. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> Putting this in a message to Omni. I don't understand the strategy of Arithia's attacks in terms of the scripting. He spent 24 gems on magic phase attacks, including elemental gems, and lost a 60 gem golem and one of his 10% air 2 dukados to deep raid our cap circle. Meanwhile, the raiding parties of hoplites were poorly, poorly mage supported, weak enough that they bounced off PD. Yeah, and all the PD other air 2 dukados are now potentially exposed to retaliation. Can't rule out that he has shade mail set up to evacuate them or some annoying plan involving wizard towers, bringing in a fairy trod while he moves a stack of mages forward, etc. But I guess we just need more intel. One thing that I would say about the stack that bounced, though, is that that wasn't due to lack of mage support. That was due to the leader getting sniped because he was bringing one naked wizard. Right. Well, you know, that also was lack of mage support. If he had two mages, it would been less likely his one commander got killed. Yeah, I suppose. But, like, I, I still yeah. think more just that any commander would have been fine there. Right. Yeah. Fighting Pan is a real challenge. With how mobile Synthar Sages are, it can pretty easy... It's pretty easy for him to hit any specific province with one of those 10 to 15 mage reverse communions that seems pretty scary versus anything low commitment. And our gems and gear really stretched uh, fighting Pan and Arithia at the same time. Meanwhile, killing 20 centaur sages a turn doesn't make any progress towards breaking Pan. He has enough infrastructure to make 20 more mages every turn. So we need to kill his chaff and a lot more mages than that. Also planning for possible dryads is the worst. I'm pretty confident about the dryads earlier, but yeah. Yeah. You can also try to raid the cap circle, but of course that's a, the, the circle around your army, but that's of course hard with all those sages too. Yeah. <clears throat> We've got an interesting strategic situation where it looks like Pan's sacreds are trapped inside the fort we're sieging. I'm sure he knows how Wailing Winds works on besieged armies and will ride out after doing everything possible to gem burn us. Uh, we plan to take the fight. Expect some fireworks. All right, sweet. <laughs> you and I called that, too. We're like, he is not the kind of player to, like, oh, let's probe. He's like, nope. <laughs> let's take the fight, yeah. Yeah. I think this would have been one of the situations where leaving a trap would have been helpful just because you still don't know what Pan's doing. But, you know, like we talked about last turn, this is just a yeah. playstyle difference. If he can kill our hyper-geared Doomstack which I unfortunately know of several ways for him to do, then we're at, on our way out of the game. That's always something you don't want to say. There's lots of ways, or there's several ways he could kill me, but if he does it, we're, and if he does it, we're fucked. Um, yeah, I think if you're in one of those situations, especially when you have the flexibility to to dodge the fight, I think it's it's worth just, you know, seeing what he's got, and then you can take it once you've, you know, made an evaluation about whether or not you can beat that. So, and similarly to how last turn Gath in dodging the Vettiheim stack actually killed part of its reinforcements. He also has a pretty decent chance of doing that because he's surrounded by so many Pan forts where there are a bunch of these sages that if Pan consolidates to fight him this turn, then moving onto one of those forts could just get him a bunch more free kills. Yeah, so I think this depends. Does Pan do something really cool and new and like roll out with a force we haven't seen him roll out with before? If he does, we might get, you know, maybe this will be pretty bad for Tianchi. The other thing I was thinking about is that in light of the new evidence that, that Arithia stabbed them, maybe you decide, let's play a defensive war against Pan, which is going to be very hard to win offensively with the mobility of the sages. And we shift to conquering Arithia, who from all the evidence we have so far this game is going to be easier to conquer, certainly their land-based stuff, than Pangea. So yeah, I honestly that don't would, think that would be another vote for, for dodging the fight. Yeah, but I also just don't think that either of the two players, Panji or Arithia, have shown what they have in the tank yet. So it, it's very hard to yeah. fight someone like that, where you know that they're ahead of you on research, but you still don't even know what their research is. But Arithia's had major losses so far. I mean, I guess Pan's had some, but I always felt like Pan's losses were way more expendable than Arithia's. That's fair. Like, I would say in Arithia's case, though, it came down to individual blunders, like just, you know, walking an army into a trap. Right. Um, less So more so that rather than like, oh, this guy can't script, which I don't think you right. can really expect in a tournament finals anyways. Yeah. Okay. But I think you're right. They they both have they both have yet to show us what they've got what they've got in store. We're not really capable of producing a more high commitment army in terms of what tools we bring for the next 10 plus turns. We have enough troops that Wailing Winds should route everything before they die. But we're trying not to put all our troops in the same army, so uh, so that some of them might not end up blind blind. 
guess that means solar brilliance. Yeah, especially because when fighting someone that can do reinvigoration much more easily than you, or sorry, not reinvigoration, recuperation much more easily than you, it's always something you have to worry about. Yeah. The last turn, so this is from Gath, the last turn was quite bad and very strange. Five spells bounced off the Corruption Dome in 27. By the way, having used it in this game as well, I'm starting to like it more and more. Such a nice tool to have. Yeah, Dome of Corruption is pretty good. Dome of Corruption is pretty uh, good if you can cast it in someone else's province. <laughs> that too. <laughs> But it's also good if, you, if you're putting it in, like, basically not a place that's a huge mage center, right? If you have, like, four or five mages there, but you're going to have an army that, like, goes through it for a turn, you know? Like, know. if you really only need it for a turn, it's a pretty good good dome. Yeah, I just don't like moving, like, an army that... Or if I don't like moving mages that your army requires to go do stuff through a horror dome. That just feels bad. Yeah, I mean, because you could have car- horrors come eat you before you have, like, some important fight, and it's like all of a sudden your army of gold casters dead. Exactly, yeah. And and if I recall correctly, the horror attacks occur in the magic phase. I think so. I think it's before normal phase. Um, So it it always feels very risky to use horror dome as like an actual dome. Yeah, I think it's after magic phase before normal, but I'm not positive. I think it's in the assassin phase. Um, I know that regular horror attacks are in magic phase. Okay. But I don't, or at least like the astral corruption type stuff. Um, well, we might get to find out this game. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. And Vetti did something quite irrational. He moved into three. But if I stayed with my stack, he would have been completely crushed without his god. Tests show that there was not even a remote chance that he would win that. I don't understand why he made that move, except to follow my pattern where I behaved the same during all the sieges. During the, all the sieges, I won this game. Still, it's hard for me to believe that he was willing to risk his powerful stack like that. Maybe I'm not seeing something. But he did. Killed my Archdevil in a Gadol, and it was quite a victory for him. One good thing is that that they seem to have discrepancy in their test results, because Eddie Hunt had said that he tested that in one seventy percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. It could be... I, I think, that, yeah, we'll, we'll see. It, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, Gifts of Heaven lands or Wailing Winds is going, which casters run or get killed. Because it's like, if you lose an important one, it could be just swing everything. But I, I don't know. But yeah, I think you're right. It's a, it's a big discrepancy. One good thing is that Zabalba managed to mind hunt the giant Shaman Thug, so his gear and Twiceborn form are now gone. Yeah, that's always a tricky thing. Uh, looking at the Fresh Wizard Tower and Vetti continuing to spend gems, I certainly it certainly looks like I underestimate his income and reserves. I don't I don't know what you guys are thinking about positions and power levels, but to me the game feels pretty amazingly even at this point because each nation has its strengths and potential and is scary in its own. I don't think this is true at all. And it's in quite unique regard. Yeah, I think that Gath is and Pan are the two in leading positions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think they're in a they're in a tier above everybody else. Yeah. And some of that is honestly just the the capital of their alliance, like the goodwill they have towards each other. And if they want to, they can probably stick together and kick everybody else out of the game. At this point, yeah, especially if Pan can do a nexus. Yeah. I'm honestly feeling that the end is far away. That's probably still true. But seeing Dark Citadels from Zabalba at at 20% discount, for example, which I can't afford, I'm realizing that his blood and sacred potential is vastly larger than mine. I wouldn't say that it's vastly larger so much as he's doing it first. Like, Shivaldi is grinding down his empire in order to get all of the blood slaves now, whereas Gath has been doing it at a much slower pace. Yeah. While shock resistance will always be his weakness, the sheer numbers he can produce now... 2.57 2.57 or less slaves per Aussie is incredible. Tanshi might fall off eventually, but he has so many great sites, including discounts, that it really doesn't feel like it's happening anytime soon. His plays have been great as well. Pan does have some real blood developed and has lots of money and gems from all the globals. He has at least a part of every gem global. So that's some of the things we're not seeing in the graph too. Arithia is obviously a wish factory, which no one knows for sure whether it's fully functional yet, but it should be. Yeah, I have obviously a whole lot of... Go ahead. It, it's just a matter of how many Wishcasters he has. Like, if you have only yeah. one Wishcaster, that's like, you know, 11 point... Or 12.5 yeah. gems. It's not that big yeah. of a deal. 
We haven't scanned them for alt sites too, but alt sites are kind of like a win condition for for Arithia. So we did at one point. We didn't last okay. time we tried. Well, Vettiheim, I hope this turn goes better for me, better for me than the previous ones, and his power level goes down. Yeah, I I, I think Zabalba has a very long road ahead of them to win the game. I think if anything, I think they're vulnerable right now. They're like more on a food tier. They're not, I mean, they're certainly not easy food, but they are a nation that if they got coalitioned right now, I think they would just die. He and she, I think it depends how these wars go, especially because they could shift into fighting Arithia and winning, maybe, or if they win some big battles against Pan, maybe. I don't, I don't have great feelings about Tianchi. I mean, I think Pan and Gath are by far and away in the better positions right now. Yeah, I think that Tianchi's uh, issue is that they are pretty strong right now, and they do have these very strong Doom stacks. But that's mostly because they have been making these major investments and commitments, like that they right. actually are deploying a very significant portion of their strength to all of their battles, and the people that they're fighting historically have not. And that's kind yeah. of why they've been able to come out with these wins, is, is just a matter of like they're actually putting their gems and research all out onto the field. So they're actually just showing a larger, I would say, percentage of their potential power, whereas other nations that they're fighting are not. Right. Um, okay, so let's do this. Bunch of horrors. We'll go through some of the horrors. Oh my gosh. Three horrors. So two horrors and a ghost riders. This is the first time we've seen ghost, ghost riders, I think. It's a great spell. A very efficient raiding tool, but something that we saw Arco do quite a lot or Pelagia do yeah. quite a lot last year. And it's something that, like, if you have a lot of liches, it is very easy to spam. Yeah. And it's indie, so it comes in with the horrors. And it's on the horrors team, yeah, which is also fun. Right. Yeah. It's also very good at triggering gym bait. More reliable at triggering gym bait than like Sin Lesser Horror and stuff like that. So that and that was the purpose of this. So this was a successful gym bait <coughs> against T and Chi. Horror's hitting Vettiheim, Horror hitting Zabalba, but fails, so this is Vettiheim casting this. Oh. This is spicy. We've got a golem coming in to take out a hydra. That's a and this is of course a twice guy. born. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's gonna do soul slay because hydras actually have low MR, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thirteen MR. Hydras aren't that low. Many other transformed targets do have low MR. And we hadn't mentioned this, but Gath had. We hadn't talked about this, I should say. But Gath had mentioned in his thing that another Vettiheim thug had gotten mind hunted. Yeah. Yeah, and soul slay does not allow for the twice born. So that's uh, yeah. another Tartarian chassis down. We we haven't, you know, we've seen Vettiheim deploying these size six chassis, but we haven't seen any of them like actually in their their tart form. And it's kind of a greedy thing that Vettiheim's doing, where they're like, "I'm going to try to get value out of the first form and then value out of the second form." But I think we're seeing here how this gets handled by really good players, which is really good players that are like, "Oh, you're never going to get the second form." Because this is now the second size six chassis, which has gotten killed and never got to twice born. So this is a big deal. Yeah, especially given that these are, are not like reliable at all. Like you have to roll a fair number of transformation attempts in order to hit it. Yeah, I mean, getting it's probably uh, the way I would think about it is it's probably on average, like you have to pay like 40 or 50 gems to get one of these, like through transformation castings. OK, we've got it looks like there was probably an army here before that stealthed away. That's the only thing that would really justify this many horror casts on a Vedi province. Bunch more raiding. Some of them successful against the ball, but Arithia doing Arouse Hunger against Tian Chi does not work, as Arouse Hunger is tend to do. Four heavy cav just slaughtering the ghouls. Okay. We have a Vettiheim versus Pangea battle here, and this might have been triggered in the magic phase. Vettiheim is the attacker. So yeah, he sent... There's a stealth... This guy Cloud Trap, he's in. Yeah, which and then is, this was stealthy. So he was basically so using that, the Cloud Trap piece to trigger the magic phase attack by using the stealthy army. Right. So the army was already there. When Pangea moved into the province, this Vettiheim army was there waiting for it, but hidden. And then this turn, magic phase in, the army pops out and attacks, and now we've got a battle. Ooh, Thunderstrike nailing those Rimvedi. Soul Slay's coming out. Oh, Enslaved Mind. These Rimvedi are getting converted. 
Pangea says, I want some Rimvetti. Yeah, and when you have that many Astral Mages, it's pretty easy to get away with just, like, killing stuff with random Enslaved Mind stuff. Like, you don't need Master and Slave if you just have enough Astral Mages casting the individual version. This reminds me of, like, Conquest of Elysium. Uh, <laughs> this is, like, when you play one of those, I forget which of the factions, and it's like you basically just go around recruiting stuff with Charm Spam. It's, oh, yeah. One of the nature factions, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah. he. I mean, he's, he came out ahead on troops. He lost one Sage for 90 gold, and he gained seven you know, Rimbedi, yeah. Seven Rimbedi at 25 gold apiece. Uh, that's pretty sweet. Especially, And this was that, a fight that Vettiheim picked. Yeah, I'm surprised that Vettiheim picked that fight. Because, I mean, 16 Centaur Sages is not trivial. Like, if you're fighting into that, you basically need Howl, I think. Um, yeah, Hal would go a long way. Big air elementals from this guy he cloud trapped he's in also probably would have made a big difference. Yeah, wow. especially given how little or how uh, squishy Pangea's chaff is. Um, I yeah. believe that he did do buffs before doing the communion, though. And ethereal sages are fairly resilient against getting trampled. Yeah, we'll take a look at it one more time and just see what the, the majors were doing back here from Pan. What oh, no, he did the communion right away. Okay. Yeah. Was, Oh, he's, he There's does still the, a fair amount of round two. I think yeah. air elementals might have made the difference, maybe. It would have at least you know, Some of them would have been sure. in melee, so they've been trying to punch it and then not casting Enslaved Mind. It would have helped, that's for sure. I think Howl yeah. would have done more, though. Yeah, Howl would have been really good here. The only problem with Howl is he would have stolen the wolves, so these guys would have gotten outnumbered. Yeah, I suppose so, but I mean, that's kind of what you want Howl to do. Right. You want them to be wasting their enslaved cast on the wolves. Yeah, but I'm just saying the problem is then there's a bunch of wolves you have to fight. So it might have been you needed like how plus air elementals. <laughs> yeah, possibly. But yeah, he definitely attacked into this army with what looks to be just less stuff than what he's fighting. Like more troops, but significantly fewer mages. Yeah, and I think while we can say like tactically, this was a, you know, maybe a bad decision for Vettiheim. I think what this also is just kind of validating is maybe Pangea's thought process about the game and how they're thinking about their strategy. I mean, when you have somebody that does this thing that Vettiheim did, you know, it's a Vettiheim army of 90 guys and they're popping out with a magic phase attack, pretty sure they're going to beat you. And you just by accident, basically steal their whole army. <laughs> like that means you've got a pretty strong strategy. Yeah. And no, I do think that the baseline strategy of just using these very efficient communions is very strong. I mean, there's a lot of nations that kind of lean on only this as their strategy. It's just that it can't be your only strategy when you're fighting into someone that's using very significant, like, death stack style armies. Uh, if Because if you can't actually answer that, then they'll win the critical battles and take the force. Right. Right. Like, so like, so this that's is what great, we have to see. I want to see... So there's else. potentially going to be a big battle here where Pangea is attacking T and Chi, and there's potentially going to be a big battle with Vettiheim t attacking Gath. And so let's go watch these, because I don't want to spoil them. Oh, but I'm not sure which one of these mean? it might be. This is a so, small one, yeah. I don't think this we're going to watch. Well, we already watched it. <laughs> yep. That was a, a brief that was raid. A quickie. Yeah. This nope, is a this. raid. Yeah, just fighting province defense. And these are both successful raids so far. Yeah. Here we have Pangea attacking Gath. I wonder where that is. Maybe. Oh, this is the this is the oh yeah this death gem harvesting part. yeah. <coughs> Pangea attacking TNG Bergamum. Might this be it? This is it. Okay. Okay. So this is the TNG army, and that is a fair number of sages. We'll have to wait until Ooh. we see the battle report to get a count, because I definitely don't want to try counting those by hand. Yeah, it's at least eighty, and we haven't said this in a while. But get out your popcorn, ladies and gentlemen. We have a big battle. This is at least 80 centaur sages. And this is T and Chi's army. And while there's not a tremendous number of mages, pretty much all these mages have one or two or two or three items on them. And they're kitted to do cool stuff. Like, you know, with these, a lot of these have matrices, so they're wired in to basically do turn one communion stuff. And then they've got reinvigoration so they can like have fatigue through rigor mortis and things like that. And on Pangea's side, a bajillion mages. And I see gems. Okay. We've got some gems. Ooh. 
That's is that Soul Train? I think that's Soul Train. That would make sense, but like, because I guess he's just trying to keep his slaves up. But yeah. his own units are by no means immune to it. I guess with anti magic master generation, then it's not going to kill the rest of your army qu that quickly. Mm. That's probably life after or wailing winds. No, because it's a yeah. He's air empowered. That's the wailing winds caster. He almost certainly has army of gold here as well. I like yeah. the random like one gems that he's got scattered across his sages because to me that's implying that he's going to be doing elemental spam as well. And air elemental yeah. equipped with army of gold are fantastic. Like there is yeah. no stage in the game where those stop being relevant. Yeah. Like if you get air elementals out and you get them with army of gold and fog warriors and quickness, like those things can be your win condition just by themselves. Yeah, I don't have the time to sit here and go through each of these, but it looks like maybe one in four of them has a gem on them for probably an elemental. All right, well, let's, let's watch see what this. He actually does. And his units really are bodyguarding, so that this is just the big communion thing that we were talking about. And then, okay, so he's creeping mm -hmm. doom for his chaff. So now we've got Storm, Thal Vapors, Quagmire, Wailing Winds. Wailing Winds. Oh, two Wailing Winds. And Rigor Mortis cast by TNG. Which makes sense because TNG's kind of set up for this reinvigoration thing. Oh, goodness. Is that so Master TNG's going to fly in now. Did we, oh, was there Master and Slave? There was some <laughs> battlefield wide effect that just went through. But yeah, the mass flight. Oh, because they were Army already of in Lead. the air. It was already in the air when the storm went up. Yeah. So now there's Army of Gold, Fog Warriors, all the things. Oh, okay. Solar there's Brilliance has come out. Solar Brilliance, and, and that's a good one for Pangea just because all their stuff has recuperation. So they can blind both armies and come out okay. Well, and they have a lot of these elementals, which are blind. So that's another nice thing about it, is they don't care if they get blinded. Yeah, and Enslaved Mind certainly doesn't care about that either. Right, it's kind of a weird feature in Dominions that if you are blind, like a bat you actually are immune to being blinded. And being blinded is a debuff, but being blind is not a debuff. So you go figure that out with your PhD. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, how does that work? I think it's more like natural blindness or being able to, like, you could call it blind sight, maybe. Right. Yeah, that would make more sense. Okay, wait, so what else has happened? We've got Soul Train... Yeah, you were right. Wrathful Skies. And that keeps the communion slaves alive as well. Oh, this golem that did Soul Drain also did Rigor Mortis. That seems odd to me. So this was something I mean, that came up in the game chat. Yeah, we know that Rigor Mortis applies twice. So like it is doing like 20 fatigue per round. But looking at the battlefield, I don't see why Pangea couldn't have just taken this conventionally. Like I think if you just... Bur like he's... If you just look at where the battle is taking place, right? It's kind of stalled out. Um, the stuff is being blockaded in, so like his elementals aren't killing TNG's mage core. But if both sides are sitting, like just sitting back, firing retail evocation at each other, I think the guy that's got forty more mages spamming enslaved mind has an advantage. So I think this is what's happened: is TNG's plan was that hey, I'm going to put up rigor mortis and I'm going to cast relief, but I'm also going to have. Um, re like reinvigoration on all my guys, either from earth power or from items. So like this guy's got four reinvigoration. So he's like, we're going to do that. And we're good through our gear, through our superior equipment. We're going to be able to keep casting things through rigor mortis. But Pangea probably won't. Pangea, these guys, so this is a slave. He's got the four reinvigoration. But the Masters, most of them, I guess the Masters, yeah, not a lot of the Masters won't have it. It's so like this Master doesn't have any. So I think his thinking is like, okay, I, I'm going to put them to sleep, but I'm not going to be asleep because I've got reinvigoration. And when Pan casts it, they're saying, no, you're going to be asleep and I'm going to be asleep. And then it's going to come down to all of the summons. Yeah, but if that's the plan, then you don't need this many mages. Like if you're bringing this giant communion to spam and slave, then you probably want to actually use that communion. If you're putting everyone to sleep anyways, then you can do this with like, you know, half or a quarter of this many sages. Yeah, that's possible. But, I mean, the sages did put out a tremendous volley of summons. Like, part of their job was to make the summon army. I suppose so, but he didn't need all of them for that. Yeah, that's probably true. Like, I don't think you would do that with zero. He, yeah. 
sages, but you definitely don't need very many. Also, it's kind of funny he's petrified all those cubes. Yeah. So there are no spells coming up, hardly any. A celestial chastisement, a horde of skeletons. There's only a couple of people who are casting anything. Pretty much everybody's permanently asleep. I think the golems are the ones that are still able to cast spells. Yeah. You petrifies coming out. Now, what's interesting is Wrathful Skies is up. And Soul Drain. And, and Ravenous Swarm. But these guys don't have shock resistance. Oh, yeah. He's, I mean, they he's put, they, zapping himself with... Uh, right, they did the shock resistance buff, but they also did Army of Lead. But uh, they do have Will of Fates, and they do have Regen. So and they also just what, have much higher hit points. Right. They, they have enough hit points where they can generally survive being hit by one Will of... One Lightning Bolt. Oh, and so then if they Regen back again. up before they get hit a second time, which is pretty likely with Will of Fates, they don't die. They also have a life after death going, which is kind of funny because when the Solas come back, they're immune to rigor mortis. Oh, huh. The downside, though, is that if your guy's already routing and he gets turned into a Solas, yeah. he melts. Which I think is happening some. But, yeah, you know, we... if they turn into a Solas, they're dead anyway, so... It's not like it is bad. Yeah, I mean, no, life after death is definitely helpful, but, yeah. All right, so I said get out your popcorn, but I'm not sure this is the most entertaining battle, just because everybody's asleep. Like, I, I reported this as a bug in Dominion 6, like in the, the forums. Because I don't think this is peak gameplay, having both sides cast Trigger Mortis and having it stack. I don't think this is a fun way for the game to go. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's interesting in that there's several buffs where it's obviously your side casting something like Hell, where it makes sense for both sides to be able to have this active. But you don't get double Acid Storm or double Firestorm, I don't think. I believe after investigation that pretty much all of the all of the battlefield wide supply twice, like including Wrathful Skies. Huh. So I guess the fatigue spells are unique then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the the grip of winter and things, yeah. So and we're about to hit the term timer and everybody's gonna go bump. So this I don't think is actually peak dominions. I think in my mind, this isn't an abuse, but I think it's a bug. I think this should be changed. I don't think it's good game design, really. Well, it certainly um, limits what you can bring. Right. Um, however, this was not an accident. This was pan... I, so, first of all, it's it's noteworthy that neither you nor I, who played this game more than... Like, enough we would be embarrassed to say, had no idea that both, all Battlefield enchantments applied twice, except for, like, a grip of winter and... Um, heat from hell. And even those probably apply twice. They just also cancel each other out if you have the opposite. Um, so first of all, it's kind of weird that like vets don't really, most vets don't really know about it, but you know who did know about it? The Pangea player, because they did this very intentionally. They're like, okay, we can't, even if we have relief, we'll get passed out. He and she, and as you can see, because the battle kind of went on and on and on, how that probably would have gone is T and Chi stuff would have stayed awake the whole time if there's only one rigor cast up, and they would have probably chewed through Pangea stuff, which would have fallen asleep. So with that in mind, if this is Pangea's like intentional play to do this double rigor battlefield wipe, why did they bring 89 sages? Yeah, that's a good question. Because they did, you know, they lost pretty much all of them. Like good that's game a no major re. commitment for what functionally would work is just a trap. Yeah. I'm not sure. Now, he lost some things that were very important. He lost this death-empowered golem. This was very expensive. He lost the Harpy Queen, which was a national hero. Though that may... Oh, no. And then, of course, he lost all these sages. What he didn't lose was much gear. Most of these guys didn't have gear on. There's a little bit of gear on the golem. Uh, a little like bit of gear on the lich. Hat and stuff, yeah. Yeah. I would say, like, looking at Pangea's commitment, I don't know if he knew about this interaction. He did. Like, I'm telling you, he did. Then what's with the like? Why do you lose so much stuff doing this? Then like you've got to be able to well, he do that. He tested this a bunch, right? So TNC, let's look at. So TNC's thinking about the fight. They're saying, "I've got this army. There's nothing they can do to fight it." And Pangea, they tested this a ton. They figured out that hey, if we double cast trigger, we can beat it. If we don't, we lose. What I don't know how sensitive, and you know, Warp PC, you can put this in the chat. 
Oh, my dogs are hopefully not coming through on the sound. But what I don't know is how sensitive this is to reducing Sage's numbers. Because what you're saying is, like, if you're doing this and it's a trap and you're basically going to fatigue out the whole battle, like, can't you do this with 40 fewer Sages? For fewer. Like, you want to basically right. bring the minimum possible to stall out the fight long enough to, you know, actually go to that turn timer. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously you bring a little more to be safe. But you don't need 90 Sages. Right. So that's kind of golem for this. I think you could do this with a lich. Um, right. So I think these are all very valid questions. And the only thing, I my intuition aligns with your side. I think you're right. But the only thing I know is I know that warp PC probably spent hours testing this and like a bunch of different permutations. And if I do this, don't do that. I don't know how it would have gone if he brought twenty sages. If he did, if he didn't do the soul drain golem, like how important was soul drain? If you're really just timing out the battle, so I don't know. Yeah, but I, we'll yeah, leave that to the players. It's a strong mechanic, though. It's like you plan on somebody's going to do. You know, this player is going to do rigor mortis, and you're like, okay, I'll do rigor mortis too, and just double like make sure we both fall asleep. Hopefully, this gets changed. Some of his stuff, though. Like, if you look at the losses, Pangea lost a higher percentage of their mage core that they brought to the battle, just because a fair number of TNGs were able to retreat. Right. Because the battle timed out, and TNG, this actually goes to that point, TNG did have more reinvigoration on his mages, so his mages were much more likely to wake up and run off. He uh, kept his god alive, importantly. The right. Mother. Yeah. So that was this one in Bergamum. Let's see if we can we can watch this Vettiheim Gath battle. We'll just check all the Vettiheim attacks on Gath. I, oh, this isn't it. It might be a Gath attack on Vettiheim, given that they had seen where their army is now. Ooh, Utgard, I think is what. Oh no, it wasn't Utgard. Vettiheim attacking Gath and Utgard. No, you're right. It could be Gath attacking Vettiheim. But we'll just do this from the map here. But we're yeah, gonna it's click possible on it. that there was no big battle between the two after all. Well, I suppose we can check out the sites where Gath has major armies. Because if there was oh. a big battle, it would be in one of those places. So Vettiheim stealthed away. Okay. So this is... The, the Vettiheim army was here last turn, and the Gath army was here, and they switched places. So Gath attacked into Vettiheim, thinking, okay, you're going to fight. I'm going to run into your army, so... Because my army's bigger, if you had other things that were going to join in, they'll miss the fight. Yeah, it makes um, sense for Gath to try to do another bump because they were able to successfully push out a section of their army last turn. Right. And then Vettiheim just didn't push <clears throat> it. Yeah. yeah. And so then basically nothing happens here. This is a, a very, very bad position for Vettiheim, though, I would say. Oh, something happened here. So Vettiheim put the god inside. Oh, it's like, okay, you're going to try return. storming. No. No, it looks like it must be... What is it? Well, is uh, this Soul Drain? Get... It's Rigor Mortis and... Soul Drain requires more pearls, I believe. Yeah, it does. This must just be Rigor Mortis. But, like, Gifts of Heaven, dude. I think Gifts of Heaven just blow this guy up, right? If they hit, I suppose, yeah. And he'll probably also have, like, advanced casting E3s that will shatter it. Yeah, that's, that's more of what's reliably going to kill this thing. On the other hand, calling it back is relatively easy as well. And we don't see air gem. Oh, but Gath has a lot of shock resistance. I was going to say, we don't see air gems for Wrathful Skies either, which is kind of the cool thing about this idol is it's like a Wrathful Skies idol. Okay. So that's, this also strikes me as strange because I think this would just get run over by Gath's army, but... Yeah, I don't think that this was intended to be something that's going to win the battle so much as something that can cause some damage. Okay. Just based on how cheap it is to call back a god late game, if you can use a god as a super combatant without investing heavily into its gear, it's often worth doing that. That's part of the strength of these immobiles. Yeah. You can't, you're can't. you literally prohibited from investing in the gear. Right? So it's like, if it dies, it's just some mage turns. Yeah. Or priest but turns. Looking at the at the map here, Gath has oh god. just swept through Vettiheim's territory this turn. Oh, God. So this was that cool golem hydra fight. And then here's the horrors raining in. Yeah, so, so just the horror rating to take terror of the vampires and, now. And lords, yeah. 
Gath has done an amazing job this turn of just taking ground, given oh that he kind of... Basically, what Gath did this turn is he saw, okay, I can beat Vediheim's army. So he went to go take that fight. And then at the same time, tried to take as much territory as possible because he now believes that he wins the head-to-head, -head, like Doomstack Battle. Right. And he's, he may very well be right in that sense, which means that you, you want to do exactly this. You want to just keep pushing ahead. Yeah. And Gath is just stomping Vettiheim right now. It's just looking so desperate. I mean, it was looking desperate last turn. This turn it's looking like, oh my god. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's almost to the point, maybe you're like, okay, you have this, let me come back and defend my capital with the army I had down here. And maybe that's what Vettiheim's done. But that wouldn't really yeah, that wouldn't, make sense with the god. That also wouldn't jive with all the magic-based stuff that Gath was doing. So I definitely don't think that they worked out anything diplomatically. Yeah. It, it is an option, and this is one of the things Arco had mentioned to me, is like, Bettyheim can just give this stuff to Gath, be like, okay, guys, you want this huge Gath to be more empowered, I'll pull back. And then he pulls back, and as long as he defends his core territory and keeps up most all of his mages alive, like, sure, he's going to be really upkeep constrained, but he could potentially stay in the game and come back and take this when the, the fates, like the, the tides of diplomacy turn against Gath. That's plausible. Um, and it's not it, how I play, but it, Arco thought of it, so. Yeah, you'd also mentioned something similar to that before, like basically right when the war started, is trying to uh, basically cede a bunch of territory to Gath to set them up to be the bigger threat. Yeah. Um, which kind of fits along the same line of reasoning. Of, and, you know, in your case, it would, it would probably have been better, like if you were planning on doing that at all, you want to do it quickly because yeah. the faster that you, or the more resources that you lose basically fighting Gath, the less that you're going to have to fight against Jababa or Pam. Right. Whereas now you're already so far down on territory that I don't think that you can really set someone else up to be a threat and expect to, you know, be part, like a, a major factor in the coalition that fights them. Oh, what was that? Yeah. That looks What expensive. was this? So a bunch of sages. This guy getting the, wisely getting the fuck out. What were the sages doing here? Is this just a lab province? I don't know. They're casting luck. They're buffing up some PD. This looks... I mean, this would have worked against the light rating squad. It's a major investment for a light rating squad, though. Is there yeah. a library in this province? Oh, there was a... Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, okay. so it was just they, a research bank. They were just there. Okay. Yeah. That's expensive. Oh, God. That's not expensive. This is expensive. Oh, wait, was this it? No, this is a different one. It looks like the, it's the exact same thing from Savalba. I'm like, what's who yeah. getting deja vu over here? I mean, you, these weapons of sharpness Aussies are no joke. So these guys are already piecing out, right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're piecing right. out. Which, these guys are actually really good with the gym. You just have a gym, they can do uh, Earth Power, Iron Warrior stuff. They're really good for, for Vettiheim. Yeah, it's kind of like, it gives them some of the Shinyama stuff. Yeah, just being an E1 mage. Yeah. Sometimes that's all you need. It's all you need sometimes. But we don't have the core of kind of elite buff units that Vettiheim can kind of do. So he's kind of spending these mages without really... Like, you really do want the mages buffing up elite troops. There's leech. That's a good spell. I love leech. But uh, not spammed. This is just one leech cast. Yeah. yeah. There they go. Were they blood hunting? Did they have... I mean, we can look. I don't think so. Maybe. I'm just I think this to... is counter rating. I, I mean... Maybe he's... Nope, dude, they're, no, this is not, not a blood hunting province. Okay. This is weird to me. <laughs> One of them got turned into a frog. That's kind of funny. And charmed, I guess. Like, how do you... Because he took that frog. He's minus one. Oh, no. One of oh, Shabal's guys just... got turned into a frog. Okay. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh, that's painful. I, I, Bettyheim's dead. <laughs> Let's just say it. They're dead. Yeah, I think Bettyheim has one major battle left in them with that yeah. army that they had kind of shown against Gath before. But yeah. I agree, actually. At this point, they are, are down so much ground that they're probably no longer even a viable player. Yeah, I don't think so. I think if you want to do a do a solid to your boy TNG, you just tell him, like, hey, I'm out of the game. Here's all my gems and gold. Like this, this positions because Tianchi's like kind of diplomatically attached to Vettiheim, and right now that ship is sinking. 
I don't think that Vetty and TNG are friends, though. I don't I think, think so. Like, I, I, I think that they're it's working like, together. It's like it's the closest they're, thing TNG has to a friend. <laughs> I think that they're allied, but they're allies from like that being the map position. You know, they have yeah. to be allied. But like TNG had been talking about how Vetty Heim grinding down against Gath is a good thing, right? That's like, true. They're, they're by That's no not very mean, friendly. Yeah, they're they're by no means aligned in the same way that Gath and Pan are. Right. In that they're they're not like wishing for the other person to do well, so much as they're just fighting the same enemies. Yeah, Gath and Pan are getting everybody else out of the game, and that is not what we Betty Heim and TNG had going on. So again, this is Pangea, just the Pangea recruitment team. It's like the army recruitment agent. I really do like these stacks. I just, yeah. like I was saying, I, I don't like them as the only tool, but now that we've seen that they can do something else to do an army wipe, um, like we're seeing these be very effective in these in answering these light or even mid-sized mm -hmm. raiding and counter-raiding squads. So they're they're good at what they do. It's just that you yeah. also need something else, and Pan just showed that something else that they can do. At least one of those something else's, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, to, to Pan's credit, they just killed one of the hardest armies on the map, at and they killed expense, it dead. But at great yeah. expense, but it's dead. And that's going to make these odd stacks even more potent in practice. Because one yes. of the things about having these like mid-sized armies is that you really do need a doom stack to kill them. And this is kind of the right. same thing that like NA Pan does, where they don't have the best one doom stack, but they do have many stacks, which you need a doom stack to beat. Um, right. And once they've killed like one doom stack, if they can do that again, then suddenly these things are the dominant force on the map. Yep. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, so that that's kind of the, the symbolic... Uh, that's the significance of, of TNG losing... That army is now these stacks that are running around are going to be crazy. It's going to be really hard to control them without that doom stack. They do have that one more big doom stack that was kind of like sitting in wait. Right. That was the one to the south of the. Yeah, um, it was the previous turn. My dog keeps knocking my hand so I can't hit the keyboard. It was right here, but it moved up here this turn. So. Yeah. Wait, where are all the celestial soldiers? Oh, that's that's them. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So he lost, let's look at the, the sacred count. Okay, so 38 celestial soldiers there. 30, he lost 28 of the 36. And then he lost 48 all the cubes. cubes. That's a lot of gems. It's a lot of mage turns is what it is. It's yeah. 96 water gems, but it's also 96 water to mage turns. Yeah. Or 48 what? mage turns. Yeah. Yeah. And that's two turns of wyvern summons. Assuming he's <sighs> seen that the dragon boosts going. I mean, this is a major loss. This is a much bigger loss. I feel like this is like, what, three turns of sages that he's lost? The golem was expensive, but aside from that, it's really just three turns of mages for Pangea. I feel like this is way more than three turns for TNG. Especially in the cubes. I don't know. Like, if you losing 90 mages is very, very significant. Like, even with, yeah. or sorry, 77 mages. He, he didn't lose all 90. Um, like, that. that's just numerically massive that that yeah. is 77 fort turns like yes <laughs> pan has more forts yes pan's yeah. mages cost less so you know admittedly he can replace individual mages more easily but also that's 77 mages you can't write that off no but i think i think what i'm saying is if you this doesn't and some of this doesn't show up in the graph but if you do total gems invested here because the gear on all the guys that died and all of that stuff and then you do like some gems to gold conversion at like 20 or whatever, 25, 30 gold per gem. I think TNG lost, my guess is, I haven't done the math, but my guess is TNG lost probably at least two times, maybe three times as much. Yeah, um, I, I genuinely don't know how I'd evaluate the losses here. But I, like I mentioned when we first saw the fight, my suspicion is that it would be, there are ways to do this. Like if yeah, your goal is to yeah. do the trap, rather than right. do an army versus army battle, that you should be able to do this for, for cheaper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, especially with the, the empowered golem, right? Because a lich can cast figure mortis no problem. And a lich can right. back. Right. That's true. Um, That's yeah, very so true. On the If you look at what armies they currently have on the field, cheese stuff, like he did lose a lot of it, but he still has a fair amount in the two forts adjacent to them. Mm -hmm. So he can recreate the army, at least to some large extent. Probably with, you know, a couple fewer boosters and so on. 
and just go right back at it. I don't think you want to necessarily, especially because right. the main army seem to be relying on Rig the Mortis to at least some extent just to defeat what the sages can do normally. Like, um, that's how, kind of like how you beat these, like, you know, if you were to bring like 50 sages, then Rigor is very important to fighting that. Right, um, right. So, you know, like you are limited uh, strategically in, or tactically, I should say, in terms of what you can do with that army now. Um, but I don't think that TNG is by any means dead. And I do still think that they can bring over some very impressive armies. So they they can, yeah. they can put together a doom stack round too. Yeah. And let's take a quick look here. We see TNG re retaking a lot of their land. We don't really see, and I'm not sure where the Arithia, so the, one of the Dukados stayed here and retreated. I, maybe they did shade mail out because we don't really see most of the raiding forces. Well, the one on the lab at least was able to teleport out. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I, I don't know what the point of that alpha stripe was anymore because like, it, sure, it was annoying, but you spent a bunch of gems doing that. Right. Yeah, and these gems are really important because Arithia needs to get up, like, his wish farm going and get more wishers. And, and like, if anything, Arithia would, like, I think it could be Arithia position. You, like, can't, maybe you have one Doom stack that's, like, gem reinforced, but you'd be much more happy playing Arithia maybe a bit more like Pan, where you, like, maybe disposing of some gold. Because, like, the gems you need to get your, that's, like, how you scale your economy. So... Yeah. I mean, you still need I to mean, spend some, but... Arithia at least has put together one serious army from the looks of things. Um, Is I'm that this one? Yeah, I'm surprised at seeing a lack of additional summons here, though. But this is at least a somewhat decent mage commitment. I mean, it kind of has... This would die to the same Vettiheim bullshit that happened earlier. And Vettiheim and THU are, like, on the same team. Yeah. I'm trying to like, think Like, Vettiheim's like... probably going to send their god at this. You know, just do like did, I forget. Did it do foul vapors or wrathful skies or what was it? I mean, it didn't. He he ran into bone grinding. Oh, bone grinding was what it did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know what Erythia's plan is to fight that. Like you know, the bone grinding stuff, the battlefield clear. I guess. I mean, to me, this is kind of low mystics. commitment. Yeah. The other thing is that those are the mystics. Those are the the cheaper inline mages, not the Dudukos. Right. Which I mean, they're still nice communion mages, but they're they're you know you basically have to use them in a communion. Yeah, they're like. Uh, whereas the Dukados are a bit more versatile, where you sometimes get the you know like a fire two you could do without a communion, or an astral two, or an earth two, or something. Yeah, they're the guys who actually give you your offensive magic for the most part. Whereas mystics are kind of like much worse centaur sages. Those centaur sages without all the stuff that makes the centaur sages great. So yeah, I mean, Arithia's lost most of the, the uh, most of the stuff they they had gotten from the from the Alpha Strike. They're coming forth from the ocean here, but Tianchi's also got a pretty sizable army down here. Now the problem I think for Tianchi is before they would have been like, okay, we won this. This is what Tianchi wanted to have happen. They won the fight on this fort. They stormed it. They're now in a lab. They take the gear off that army and they put it on this one. And then they go win a major victory on this front. It's Agreed. a little bit like Napoleon riding from army to army, commanding it to like give each, you know, like oh. to give that army the best chance they have in battle. I wouldn't even say uh, it's like that because Napoleon had to actually get from one army to another, whereas Team G's <laughs> gear transfers instantly. Right. Yeah. So, he, you know, they're not going to be able to do that, obviously, now. Um, they did at least have a fair number of the mages retreats. They were able to recover some of it. Um, that's true. And they should have at least reserves for, if not the entire army, then, you know, maybe about half of it. Yeah. Okay. So I think that covers most all of this. Yeah, uh, we see some more aggressive raiding from Pan using their uh, satyrs. And I'm actually yeah. a little surprised the satyrs got there. Uh, if you look at the, the northern one, the, the one that's isolated, I'm surprised they were able to get that far without being patrolled out. Yeah. Here, Tanshi kills some satyrs, some Indies attack here. Ooh, that's a lot of knights. Well, that's the one you get warned about in advance, I believe. Ooh, Agartha helping out with Vettiheim. Agartha, I think, is just taking what they can. Yeah. I mean, dude, the Agartha... Agartha's probably getting close to Vettiheim in size. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> he's about to... He's about to cross Vettiheim. 
army size? Vettyheim's still got a ways to go. But Agartha's just waiting for him down here. He's like, you come on down here, I'll, I'll take your position. I'm surprised Agartha's is still alive, but I suppose everyone uh, has better things to do. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, nobody's really a free agent. Exactly, so. I think he um, could do it, but. Yeah, I mean, he. Yeah. Maybe I, I he will the, right after Vettyheim. I, I think the Gath once wanted to focus very heavily on this Vettyheim war, and for good reason. Like, Vettyheim, the Vettyheim war did not have the looks of being easy at all. Yeah. Okay, let's make sure we see all... So we saw both these. These were basically crushing, counter-rating defeats for Vettyheim. And because I think that the reason that they worked so well is that Tribalba went in with just very major commitments. So, like, he was raiding, sure, but that's, like, 65 Ozzolotls. That's, yeah. that's a lot of beef. Yeah. He's basically saying, hey, I know you're going to do counter-rating. This is going to ruin whatever you have set up unless it's a major army. It's kind of the same thing Pangea is doing. Like, these stacks are actually reasonably similar. They're designed to basically only be countered by Doom stacks. And Vettyheim's kind of fresh out of them in this part of the, the country. So. Yeah, I would say that Pangea's stacks are at least a little bit easier to beat than the Ozolotls. Because we've just seen these Ozolotls cannot be SC'd. At least, you know, not with any, yeah. like, practical effect. Whereas 16 Centaur Sages, you can, you can beat that. Oh yeah, and these ones are actually weapons of sharpness too. I didn't I didn't actually check if these were the Yeah. No, he, he brought the the Judas. Oh yeah, he did. So yeah, these these would not be easy targets for an Eiffel Jarl jumping on or anything like that either. Yeah, so I think that Pangea stacks, while still, you know, being able to beat like small counter rating forces, are much more easily answerable than these Ozolotls, which require a real army to fight. Right. And there's a kind of nice progression of the rating, you know. First turn of the war is like really light rating from the ball ball. Then Vettyheim's like stuck trying to like muster some kind of meager province defense and all the provinces left. And then now the is like, I know you're going to be doing counter rating. So I'm going to send in these kind of small armies that are going to destroy that. So. And then the other um, thing, or very random note, but one thing which I like that Vettyheim is doing is the dark vines, which are pretty cool. So dark vines are interesting in that they have armor piercing attacks. It, it's in the fort. You see oh, this one. Yeah. They're also one of the few blood summons that's not susceptible to the demonic cleansing. Yeah. Yeah. That was something I think I brought up in the game channel. I think TNG was talking about maybe they're thinking about doing it. But yeah, it's pretty cool. The problem is that with Gat, they have a hard time summoning them because you have to empower Nature Mage, basically. Oh, yeah. Look at this. Oh, wow. Got a, a ton uh, of them back here. Making that transition. Okay, very cool. Yeah. That's the thing that Shaval is actually much better at because the way can summon them. Right. So that's cool. So Shaval was actually making plans to handle the demonic cleansing. Yeah, the Zabal has had some bad experiences with demonic cleansing so far. So, And they certainly can imagine how some of the fights they had with TNG would go once once, once they have demonic cleansing. Out, yeah. yeah. Shaval was actually, for someone who like basically took some very major beatings in terms of losing Ansel Auto stacks, still seems to be doing quite well. Yeah, they're not nearly. I don't think they're a top game, position, though. but they're they have a big army. A lot of this is, I think, this is a lot more chaff than than Gath has, though. Yeah, they've got um, like corpse constructs and beast bats patrolling and so on. Yeah, can you check their income and research? Those yeah. are two. So let's just income? take a, a little stroll here through score graphs. So we'll start with income. So Zabalba, yeah. So, so they're actually getting something out of the land that they're raiding. That's kind of what I was looking at. That's kind of why right. I was curious about income, I should say. Because their core territory should be blood hunted to death. Yeah. Jim and come. They're, They're starting to catch up yeah. with the big boys. Pan, this is what Pan is, but then Pan also probably has additional income through other globals. Was there a dire port in last turn or something? That we missed? Yeah, there apparently has these oh, on. Well. Oh. Or Galegate. One of these was new. Yeah, they're they're they stole no they they actually or someone had mentioned that they'd stolen Galegate. I think that was okay. TNG. Yeah, about this stolen. So they overcast that, and then I think there also halvesies on Eternal Pyre, Solar Focus, and Maelstrom. Or yeah, 
Yeah, I think Gal said there are halvesies on every one. So Pan's gym income is probably way high. Or it could be that there are also halvesies on the one that they've cast. So That's know. true. But <laughs> even then, I think it works out to them being higher than they are. Than they're showing. But... So, okay. But so yeah. I, I think that covers. For, I mean, I don't think there's too oh, much research, more to say. Uh, the research. Oh yeah. The last one. Let's look at the, um, the research graphs. Okay, so Pan is not finished yet, but they're nope. getting close. They're getting close. And Travolta is still lagging uncomfortably behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are half of T and Chi, who is half of Gath. Is twenty percent behind Pangea, so yeah, they, they yeah, I, very. Zabalba is hard. not in the top position in this game. No, not by any stretch. But like you said, they're you know they're, they're making the their position work. Yeah, I think that they have to continue being active, and in order to yeah. do that, they need to also be able to constantly replenish their armies, which in turn requires a lot of blood hunting, which in turn nerfs their ability to produce more mages which is going to keep their research from ever being able to catch up, really. Yeah. I think their hope at like getting decent research would be like, okay, we're going to turn all our fire gems into lanterns or something like that. But even then, it's going to be a really slow slog. It's late for that. Like They should have had lantern access for a very long time already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm presuming they've done that some, but I, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's tough. I think we've covered pretty much all the things. Let's scroll through here. We, do, we definitely saw the magic phase attacks. Yeah, I definitely think we covered all the major battles. Oh, that was the Lich Farm. We saw that one. We saw this one. Yeah, those are the Enslaved Raiders. And yeah, the, those were the... We saw yeah. those as well, the Ozolotos with weapons of sharpness eating stuff. Ooh. Another... What is this? This is a regular phase attack, taking a fort. From Pangea, though. Did Pan sell this to them, maybe? Lithia. Oh, okay. I guess Pan gave them this fort. Huh. That's wild. Okay. I didn't notice that. I didn't that... even notice that Arithia had a Pan fort under siege. Yeah, because we haven't been looking. That suggests something we've been speculating on, that maybe there's some deeper Pan-Arithia cooperation. Like, And there's a lot of ways to do it. It could be Pan's giving them their water gems to get turned into pearls, and there's some you know, trade there. It could be they're planning on a nexus. You know, there, There's a bunch of different things. So, But this, when you see this kind of thing, it suggests there's like a deep coordination between these players. Yeah, I don't know what... I mean, it makes sense that Pan, the much larger nation, would want to give stuff to their allies to keep them sweet if their allies are making gains. That part I get. But, like, that fort seems just random, I suppose. Like, it's not, yeah. like, strategic or a very super rich site or whatever. It seems to just be like, here, have this ovens, I guess. Under 20 golds. It's not nothing, it's just yeah. kind of odd. Yeah, I don't know. Arithia kind of has been seeming to want handouts this game. You know, he wanted... Some free stuff from TNG, and now he's willing to kind of fight for it. Maybe he wanted some free stuff from Pan. So he's, I think he's kind of like a gun for hire here. Like, hey, give me some stuff and I'll do what you want, maybe. I guess so. And that kind of also makes sense if he is, if you is being able to afford the late game magic stuff. Like, you yeah. know, if you lack the, the size to be able to naturally fund and maintain a nexus, then you kind of need to get those resources somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's it. I think we're out of time. Yeah. Um, I think my closing thought for this is I feel like Bettyheim's dead. That's the main news of this turn. And T and Chi just got the wind knocked out of them, while Pan probably only took a punch to the face. So I think that's kind of my, my summary of the game state. What yeah, about you? One of the more interesting things to me isn't just that Bettyheim is dead, uh, but that they're dead without having lost that major death stack battle like because typically if you are going right. to you know try to bring out a death stack in defense and you know slam your army against theirs then the way that you get taken out of the game is by you know your death stack attacks theirs and loses 
In Bettingheim's case, they just couldn't get their death stack to connect for long enough that they just lost all their territory. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Um, even if their death stack were to come and wipe out this Gath army now, they're pretty much toast. I mean, that would um, still be a major hit for Gath, right? I mean, that's multiple oh, elemental royalty, a ton of unique, ton of gems. Um, oh, it would be but, devastating yeah. for Gath, but it's not going to change the Vettiheim position, I don't think. Right, it wouldn't bring them back into the game by any means. Yeah. In part, just because that's not the only player that they're fighting. Right, right. Okay, well, cool. Look forward to casting the next one with you, Sai. Yeah. And for all the viewers... Thank you so much for making it to the end. We'll see you next time.